and we're live. Co-host, <laughs> co-host number three. Um, hi, we're going to fix this real quick. They're saying they can't hear you, Trey. And that's weird because I don't have you muted. Hold on. I'm going to look at this real quick, guys. My apologies. Hmm. Uh, say something, please, so our audience can try to. Hello? <laughs> can someone please tell us if you can hear us? Because no feedback is, because I, I can hear you, so I don't. Well, the only one on is Kaza. Has a raven. That's um, who is in the chat so far. Well, at least who's talking. There's people watching, but they haven't chatted yet. Um, okay. We're not getting an answer. So, um, oh, oh, she oh, hears us now. Okay, it, good. Okay. Thank you, Kaz. I don't know what was. I don't know. Anyway, I'm... okay. So sorry. Uh, should we just start at the top? Yeah, we'll start from the top. What a strange problem. Uh, well, hello and welcome to the Modern Romantic Podcast, where we celebrate and inspire romanticism through passionate people doing incredible things. Hi, I'm auditioning for the role of co-host number three. Hi, I'm Trey, and I'm joined by my co-host, Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, I am i don't know what number I am as far as co-hosts go, but um, I want to know who number one and two are if you're number three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the thing with like auditions uh they don't ever let you say your name they just give you a number and you just walk in and be like hi i'm auditioning for this person hi i'm number 27 <laughs> okay uh, well <laughs> i i don't know i think i'm okay with being number one okay i'll wear the crown <laughs> and you wear it well i'll take one for the team thank you <laughs> Uh, well, with reference to that, I really want to dive into our guests this evening. So uh, would you mm -hmm. do the honors of introducing our fabulously funny guest here today? Absolutely. Um, welcome to the podcast, the incredible Susan Berger. From Broadway to the silver screen, Susan's journey in acting is extraordinary. And she's going to share with us her experiences, stories, and a little bit of her world from entertainment and writing. Welcome to the podcast, Susan. Thank you. Thanks for being here. This is so exciting for us. Believe me, being asked to be on a podcast about books is uh, the dream of a lifetime. Awesome. Well, welcome. We're so glad to have you. So you are, you have, you're multi-talented, you're multi multi-faceted. And so you are I mean, we know you as an actress because you were in very, so many things, Broadway, off-Broadway, and also television. And then you're also a writer. And what else? You, I, you make like a mean casserole or something too, right? I babysit well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, grandsons were over this weekend. I just got back from Vancouver where I was shooting a commercial and my son immediately called me and said, will you watch them so we can go to a movie and you can have them make the birthday cake? Aww. One is three. He Aww. made the birthday cake while the eight-year-old read the recipe. Oh, I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> now the question is, how did they do? How was the yeah. final product? Yeah. Came out well. Oh, good. I'm sure you had some supervision in there. Especially the frosting. That was really good. Ooh. We use FUD. Mm. You, what kind? Uh, there's a microwave fudge recipe that's really easy. <clears throat> and we made it vegan because their dad is vegan. 
Okay. And um, tastes just the same and just as good. So. Oh, good. And so it was his birthday? It was uh, my grandson Walter's eighth birthday. And in the past, he's made his own cake. But this year, he elected to read the recipe to us. Oh. So, um, all right. He promoted himself to. Yes, he promoted himself to head reader. <laughs> <laughs> what a cool idea to like make it for your own and then at some point you start directing others of how you want your cake to be made oh, he's very into that now yes he put a lot of pies <laughs> on it he got a seven and then he put two candles in front of it to cross out seven and then put an eight <laughs> <laughs> i love that um so with you being so like multifaceted and apparently an incredible, um, an incredible, uh, oh, I completely lost the word, which is terrible for me. Um, Probably grandmother. That, <laughs> yes. Um, so, and an incredible grandmother. Um, how, how did you make the transition between all of these different facets of being, um, being an actor, being on Broadway, going to television, and then into writing? How did you make so such transitions between these different art forms? Well, it's a long adventure. And I, I started out in acting, which is what I wanted to do more than anything. <clears throat> went to England thinking, oh boy, I can be an actor there. I'd just gotten my master's at the University of Hawaii and I flew from there to England. Got there, realized, oh, I'm here. What is the name of a theater? Better still, what is the name of a hotel? I really knew nothing. And as it turned out, they have an extremely strict uh, labor policy. And while I did get hired, I couldn't have it because they take six weeks to check it out to see if anybody else in the British Commonwealth or any American married to a British citizen can do the role. So basically you're out. Oh. And um, after that, I went back, went to New York, uh, got lucky at some point, did some, was married to a fellow actor and uh, he wanted to come out here. And I said, no, you can't because I was going back to do a Broadway musical. I go with you, you have to come with me. So we went out, made it here in 77. And he got lucky in 79 and got a role uh, in Urban Cowboy. And um, he played John Travolta's uncle. And after that, his career just took off. So at the same time, um, I had my first child and uh, we did, I decided that the world didn't need me enough that I should turn my kids over to somebody else. So I took a break for 15 years while they were growing up. And then I started back and I started in improv because if you leave it for 15 years, nobody believes you can do it. Mm. And so casting directors would see me and they say, well, you're really good, but they're not sure you can do it. So I did a seven year stretch of nothing but improv. And uh, then I got lucky and got some plays <clears throat> and then um, more improv. And my son, who is also an actor, got me a manager. And that manager of uh, Entertainment Lab made my career take off. Awesome. So there's a point to having children. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> love this well i wasn't gonna do it <laughs> who wants kids <laughs> it turned out they were really it's a good thing <laughs> so um like what was it when you when you say that your career really took off what was like one of the roles that you had that like really uh was one of those oh my gosh my life is changing moments well the biggest one of course is jury duty i have done lots of television and film and i was i was very lucky in 2020 to be cast in joel cohen's tragedy of macbeth with denzel washington and francis mcdormand and that was magical. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I don't know. Jury duty is different. 
it was an improv audition. You had to write, you had to do two monologues. Mm -hmm. And um, normally you just, you get lines and you say them. But this one, they wanted improv. And I didn't think I could do it. Even though you had uh, a history of improv. Right. But I hadn't done it in a while. And okay. my son Chris stayed in it and went to, UC I went to UCB too. And uh, I went to their musical theater thing, but he was in it much longer. And here's the deal. I am, you may have noticed, chronologically gifted. Nobody wants me on their improv team because it's like being on a team with a child or a dog. I get all the attention. They say, oh, look at her. She still talks. Uh, oh, my God. That is so cute. And uh, so um, when I, uh, other than doing classes, uh, the only person I'm on a team with is my son, who will not call me grandma or mom and um, does improv the way it's supposed to be done. But when this audition came in and they said, we just want two improv speeches, I thought, well, I had an idea, but it wasn't a great one. And my son looked at me and said, no. And he handed me a motorcycle vest and said, put this on. You came to Los Angeles in the 80s with your all-girl band, and you broke up over drugs. And now you're working at a motorcycle bar bartending, but they all respect you. I mean, that was a great idea. And then he said, for the next one, you are the manager of a restaurant in a strip mall in Chatsworth, which is a very tiny part of the valley. And if you leave to go jury duty, the whole thing will fall apart. So those were great ideas, and I had a lot of fun with it. That's, but yeah, that's a way to go. I occasionally got recognized for, you know, crazy ex-girlfriend or uh, two broke girls or uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine or some of those. But most of the time, and nobody was up to me and says, hello, you were so great in American Horror Story. I totally loved you. I, I, was, go <laughs> I was going there next, but um, <laughs> that was something Trey said to me before the show. He was like, oh, it's her. <laughs> what did you say, Trey? Um, you knew me? I, okay, yeah. that was, those were some of my favorite scenes when you came on. Because I was honestly legitimately terrified. That was such an incredible performance. Um, it was honestly legitimately terrifying to do it. Because what the audience did not see on, uh, I think it was this episode 108 or something, is we dragged these kids, put stakes through them, and then set them on fire. And the shot they chose to use was an overhead shot. We did that seven times or eight times, and we were right in front of it wow. as they set them on fire. And the whole crew was, you know, we had people by and they had masks and stuff like that. But it was still absolutely a PTSD moment. Sure. I can imagine. But still, that was my, that was my, oh, my God, that's her uh, <laughs> moments of like, and she's going to be on the show. Yes. But I won't do that kind of thing. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, well, my night's made. <laughs> Crazy. I couldn't watch it. I'm a, I, I'm not a horror fan. Yeah. And uh, the weirdest thing is, when I was here in 1969, my friend dragged me to um, a seer who was going to tell my fortune. And she said, my future was in horror films. And did I have a thing for Vincent Price? Wow. No. Like a thing thought, or a thing? like You know, like a thing for Vincent, Vincent Price. Price. Well, I've met him, but no. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's the weirdest thing ever because I would never, ever choose to do a horror film. Right. Wow. For, for me, American Horror Story was like at my limit of things. And even t sometimes there were just episodes that I couldn't, but I don't know what it was. I, I was you... really scary and I couldn't watch it at all. I couldn't, somebody had to find where I was on it and tell me, and then I told somebody to tape it for me. And then the weird thing is um, Christopher, my son, Christopher Corbin and I both did um, the, the one about, Nazi hunters. 
Hunters. It's uh, on uh, HBO with mm -hmm. Al Pacino. Oh yeah. And I'm in the first episode of season one. I figured, well, it's a, you know scary, but it wasn't scary. Not my scene. It was just I was a um, a survivor, and I was pointing the finger at somebody, and I had a Czechoslovakian accent. And there was nothing scary about it. And then at the beginning of that episode, when I sat down to watch it, they did the worst thing. They stabbed out somebody's eyes and put them in a butter statue. And I thought, I cannot. So when we got to my son's episode, he was in season or uh, episode six, I think, and he was a Nazi. And I said, you cue it up. I am not watching another in a minute of this. And his was scary. But not as scary as that first scene in season one. That was just. Wow. I don't like things with eyes ever. Yeah. But I think um, I think after watching that and then getting the reprieve of like being recognized with some more comedic performances in My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and then especially with Jury Duty. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what it's been like to um, to be filming for that and what your kind of preparation is for that kind of show? There, we had no idea what it was. It was um, advertised, the auditions were as an untitled legal drama. And after I was doing it, I spent a year trying to explain to people what we had done. Yeah. And I, going in, I was, fairly scared because I had no idea what we were going to do and what we were supposed to do. But as, as it turns out, Jury Duty is a very tightly plotted show, but there were no words. The words are ours. Yeah, I love that. And what I love is that you had 14, as many as 14 and 15 people in a room doing an improvisation with a guy who did not know we were actors. And at no time was there any over talking. And if you've ever seen improv, normally, if you get a bunch of people together, there's over talking and there wasn't. But it's because we really we had goals. Yeah. There were things that were supposed to happen. And then things that some things were just magic. For those of you who don't know the show, it is a um, comedy kind of. Uh, what is it? <laughs> it's kind of like a reality show but it's but it's not a reality show because it's you can't say it's scripted really no it it's a planned. documentary comedy on jury duty and yeah. the guy who's our hero a whole bunch of people um applied to be in a, a documentary about jury duty there was an yeah. ad on craigslist and everything and um Alexis San Pietro, one of the line producers, went through and did the questions, and uh, they were. Um, she interviewed over fifteen hundred people, and out of that, chose three or four that could maybe do this. And um, some of us were supposed to have come from that thing, that we weren't all just jury duty people that came in. <clears throat> some of us came in to try to be on the the jury because we knew we'd get paid to be in this documentary and the pay was 400 a day. And so people wanted to do it. Sure. And um, so the, it starts out for everybody in the room where they take you when you have to uh, apply for jury duty and things happened in there. And it happens that there is one guy in there that's a celebrity truly James Marsden, who's been called in for jury duty, who does not want to be on jury duty. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, so from there, he, you know, he, they got selected. And during this whole process, uh, Ronald Gladden, who is the star, he was a 29 year old contractor who just sold his solar contract business and was looking for something interesting while he went to another job, which happened to be manager of a Home Depot. But the minute he got on the set with us, the thing is we all fell in love with him. There were lots of cam because we were doing a documentary, there were always cameras. Yeah. And at the end of every day of filming, uh, Alexis and Jordan Cohen 
would take us into a room and you see some of this on jury duty, you don't see them, but you see them asking us questions about what happened today and what we thought about it. And uh, um, it was really interesting because the one thing is we needed to stay in character because he couldn't find out we weren't what we said we were. Right. And at the in episode seven, by the way, uh, they there are eight episodes. And at the end of episode seven, after the deliberation, the judge tells Ronald he has not been in what he thinks he has been in, but he's been on a hero's journey. And um, then on episode eight, we show him how we did it. Yeah, that and was the payoff. Our writers' rooms, and you know. There were the regular cameras and then there were the hidden cameras. And then when there were things like there was a scene in the restaurant Margaritaville, mm -hmm. oh. all cameras were hidden. And everybody in that restaurant, waiters, everybody was an actor. There, there was nobody in there that they couldn't control. And it was <laughs> a, a pretty amazing thing to do. What a production. Yeah. Wow. The thing is, it we finished it. Uh, I think in April of 2022 and they did not release it till April of 2023 and none of us had any idea what was going to happen with it. And they did a little, you know, uh, red carpet screening for us all. And we saw the first three episodes at the Culver theater in Culver city. And at the end of it, the director stood up and said, you know, well, we can be proud of what we did, but nobody knew if it was going to be anything anybody'd like. Right. And then one of our writers, Carrie O'Neill, who is also a wonderful improvist, put on um, TikTok, I just, Truman showed a man. And it took off. And it went crazy. And it's been crazy ever since. And I can go to the grocery store and have people stop me. This oh, has awesome. never happened before. Wow. Oh. Well, hopefully the people that stop you say excellent things to you. We all, everybody says nice things and they like the show. And the thing is, one of the things that you come away with is, uh, yes, hope and belief in your fellow humans, because Ronald's got to be one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And mostly what happens in this show is kindness. Yeah. And um, somebody said we out lassoed Ted Lasso. I don't think so, because that's one of my favorite shows. <laughs> <laughs> that. And we're nominated, which is amazing. And is. we're about to do uh, screenings for the Screen Actors Guild Awards. And then maybe for the Golden Globes, we are not Oscar material. Uh, they don't do TV shows. Right. So okay. it's just not. But it's been good for my writing uh, because all of a sudden I, I could put on TikTok, hey, I'm also a writer. And I write romance, time travel romance with older heroines. And uh, people look at it. And uh, it's been an adventure. I have two novels I haven't published yet. Um, Jennifer Cruzy, who you had on the show, is one of my favorite authors. And I follow her blog religiously. And uh, she has. Oh, girl, she wants to. It's under Susan B. James, and the first one is Time and Forever, and it won best, or was nominated for Best First Book and nominated for Best tri Time Travel. The second one, which I got the rights back from the publisher, just got them back and republished on uh, Amazon, is called Maybe This Time. And that won Best Contemporary in 2019, and it won Best Time Travel, and it won for audiobook. It came in second for best audiobook. Nice. And they're all available, by the way. I have to tell you this is audiobooks in your library for free. I haven't figured out how to get the other ones in, but when I was publishing, self publishing, maybe this time, they wanted suggestions for the cover and they wanted symbols. And I thought, I don't remember. And I borrowed my own book from the library. Because <laughs> so I, I don't generally have audiobooks. And oh, I really I like. It was a good book. <laughs> I was very happy with it. So then I went and got the third one, Irish Magic, and listened to that. I have to go back and listen to the first one, Time and Forever. 
which is about two women in their 60s who accidentally time travel to 1969. Hmm. And one finds an old love and one finds a new love. But the thing is, time travel has rules. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? And, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Somebody said, excuse yeah. me while I go buy these books. Yeah. I have two more um, that I, I need to either send out or self-publish. And the first one is called Lord Byron's Daughter mm. and speculative fiction uh, about Ada Lovelace. And if you are a computer person, you may know who that is. Ada Lovelace was Lord Byron's daughter, he, the mad, bad villain of uh, the Regency. And mm. she had a very interesting education and she got with a person who decided he could invent a machine that could think. And she said it can do more than that. And she wrote the first computer algorithm in 1824. Wow. wow. The first uh, war, our war department named the first computer language after her, Ada. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow. And you know, when they did that movie, uh, uh, The Imitation Game, Alan mm -hmm. Turing used her work. And I thought, wouldn't that be fun? If she time traveled. So uh, in my book, she time travels to uh, 1941 and uh, World War II and uh, actually does meet Alan Turing, but uh, cool. and other things happen in the book. The next one is called The Witch's Garden, and it is a rom com with uh, a woman who was a canceled uh, TV star like Ellen with a big talk show who got canceled, goes back to Vermont to the house her grams left her and finds out her grams left her more than a house. There are a bunch of magical instruments and recipes and somebody expects her to use them. And uh, there's the race, to, to apparently there are other witches in town and they're looking for the stuff. And there's a cat, of course. Of course. And her... Love, worst enemy from when she was there as a child is now turned into a vet and seems to be a nice person. And uh, also her daughter who hadn't spoken to her in 20 years uh, has come back with a child. So it's fun. Wow. Okay, these are some twists and turns. Yeah. Um, I love these plots. Um, I really want to read the one about... Um, Ada Lovelace meeting Alan Turing. Uh, that sounds incredible. <laughs> I will be I'm picking happy up. happy to give you a PDF of it. I have got to decide whether... What I was wondering is, um, I, I do know that like Soulmate Publishing would publish it for me. I, mm -hmm. I know that. But I was going to try to get an agent and see if I could go a little more mainstream mm -hmm. because of jury duty. Yeah. And... Uh, I'm not sure that can happen. I've sent it out to one more agent. And if it doesn't, I'm going to self-publish. It's been edited. I would never, ever put out a book that wasn't edited by somebody else because I've seen books that have not been edited. And I'm not. <laughs> the only person I know who's really good at it is a woman named Sarah Wind, W-Y-N-D-E. And she's a wonderful author. And she's got a series about ghosts. Mm-hmm. And uh, I asked her, and I, I have a blog and I interviewed people, uh, how she did it. But she used to be an editor. And among other things, she reads the entire book backwards to herself. I could never do that. <laughs> We both did the same thing. Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Honestly, it, we have cause in our chat said, please, 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 if anything get into book talk side of TikTok and your books will fly off the shelves. I don't know if you're aware of the power of book. Talk. I am aware of, I'm on TikTok and that was all because of jury duty. But I did put on my TikTok, which I think is under Susan James Berger, my TikTok, uh, I'd have to look. Okay. I'll and look. Uh, yeah. a funny story about that. I have heard of TikTok, but I was never going to do anything. And jury duty took off and some of us from the cast were at a woman's film festival to see a movie. And they said, oh, you have to be on TikTok. And I said, I have no idea how. And they said, we'll show you. And so they took my phone and I held it uh, landscape, which you can't do on TikTok. No. <laughs> they didn't tell me 
that you should. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. We're live again, guys. Sorry about that. Um, Our apologies, but yeah, we're back. That was wild. <laughs> we're back, though. Uh, Susan, <laughs> so, Susan, you were talking to us about um, the Liz Danger series um, and that you were inspired by that work and um, with some of the own work that you were writing. Um, and I'm not sure where we left off in that. Well, I was saying, uh, as far as TikTok was concerned, somebody had said, uh, you need to get on Book Talk. And I'm not sure I did by doing the TikTok, but I hashtagged Book Talk when I did the Liz Danger review. And I know, uh, I, I think I could have done it better, but I don't know how. <laughs> I think that's one of the fun things about TikTok is there's no real wrong way outside of like the the landscape versus the vertical thing. There's no real wrong way to to TikTok. Um, well, no, it's getting people to watch it. I I I know it had about eight thousand views, oh but I've God. had things. I have one that we knitted with somebody else that has one point five million views, but most of mine end up being about oh. Um, less some are like fifty thousand, and some are a lot less wow wow that's gonna take off though i mean i feel like what you're gonna see is is nothing but growth so i think especially I when you start when, be a flash in the pan you well, can no when you start doing like hashtag book talk on your videos when you're talking about books that's i i posted one video on my personal account that was um because i i'm a new beekeeper and oh. i did not realize that bee talk was a thing and i just used the hashtag bee talk because i thought it was cute and that video the first one i did blew up and i had no oh, idea so y you never know i think um at least from our posts i see a lot more a response to posts that we have the hashtag book talk than we do for other posts. So, Oh, okay. I was it. thinking what I'm going to do is um, as soon as I figure out how I've uh, done a thing, I, I made pages of my novel and if I can figure out how to read, this is my great American novel. Yes. Log. So Log. It's, yeah. It's called log or that's yes, the log? It's called okay. log. It's Ooh. called log. Log. And then, yes, a two year old can read this, except for in a very unfortunate tendency to pronounce the word hog pig. <laughs> log, on log. See, this okay. is frog. Frog. Oh. I love it. Oh, that's cute. Frog. Hog. Hog. Look at that little tail. <laughs> yeah. I finally decided hog. I that the hog. Did you illustrate as well? Frog. And yeah, I illustrate. Well, I figured after I wrote this, I wrote it um, in a creativity class. Uh, recovery. Cre who's the person who wrote the book on a spiritual guide to recovery and creativity? And I've just lost her name. Um, but it's a, Julia Cameron, okay. who used to be married to Martin Scorsese at one point. But oh. she wrote a wonderful book. And um, I used it. My sister used it. And I went to a class on it. And people were doing art and stuff. And I thought, I could write a book. And so I wrote the book. And since it was only 67 words long, I figured the only way that people would understand it is if I illustrated it. And my mother and my sister are wonderful artists. I don't feel I have a lot of talent there. But I thought, well, I could draw one hog, one dog, one log, one frog, one bog, and then move them around on the page and scan them. So that's what I did. I love it. That's so cool. I love that you found a way anyway. That to me is, that's great. And that you, you know, some people would just be like, oh, I don't draw and then not do anything. So go good. Good for you. I think that's awesome. 
I have a bunch of children's books I have not sold. Well, two of them I did. Uh, I had a, a publisher for children's books, Guardian Angel Publishing. In my life, I have worked for Miracle Films, uh, Guardian Angel, Soulmate. There's one I'm missing here. Um, but but all of the names have been, had like interesting connotations right anyway guardian angel picked up my first book which my son christopher and i wrote together when he was 10 oh. and it was published when he was 25 i did not illustrate any of the books that were published uh Ooh. then i did a a non-fiction book called earthquake on for kids on what it's like and what you should do and then i did one uh when I grow up and mom is there a Santa Claus. And then they took two more of my books, um, Sunday cat, which is about a cat that does nothing but snooze. And um, Ella, uh, my, my sister Ella about an, uh, uh, an autistic child from the, the Sibs point of view. And they bought both of those and then they went broke. So those oh. two never got published. And of course, the others are mostly not available, but I went ahead and bought the art for Mom is There a Santa. And it currently is available as a Kindle book. Hmm. Okay. I published the picture book itself with uh, Ingram Sparks, and that turned out to be a really terrible experience. Oh, no. So um, I had all the art, and I had the original, the publisher gave me the original thing. For some reason, not in the, um, you know, they send you a picture of what they're going to do. And there was an extra page at the back. When they published it, there were two extra pages at the back. So four blank pages. So people kept returning it. Oh. And I objected and I said, you did this wrong. And instead of which they billed me for all the books that were returned, having never paid me for any of them in the first place. I kept oh. my price low and apparently their price went up for oh, uh, no. printing and uh, they failed to tell me that, that they would use the new printing price. And so I made no money and they gave me back all these books with four pages, miss, you know, four blank pages. So everybody figures something's missing. Right. So I may do that again with somebody else. Sure. But in the meantime, it's on Kindle because it was a, a cute book. And Casey Snyder, the illustrator, is just lovely. Okay, Susan, this is another one of those coincidence moments of that was you. Um, and I didn't realize that until now. Uh, my mom and I actually picked up uh, Mom, Is There a Santa? Um, like, like after it was published. And we bought that book. Uh, and it is sitting at her house right now. Aww. <laughs> Wait, that's awesome. Uh, I'll just pull a copy. I yeah, love it. Because I recognize like that oh, name. Kind of, I'm not kidding. Mom, oh my um, gosh. Mom will go and like look at different books and things that have been published, like specifically children's books, because I've got a very young nephew. Um, and so like we saw it and she loves Santa Claus in general. Um, and so she picked that up and she's like, Oh my God, like what a cool, what a cool concept. Uh, and so she has it somewhere at her house right oh, now. That is so sweet. That's amazing. I love it. Well, I have copies to give away if you don't mind four blank pages at the end. I, I would be happy <laughs> with four blank pages at the end. Did oh, you just one of the originals? Yeah, it is without the four blank pages, but I have oh. a bunch of those. So um, like your your copy at your mom's house has four blank pages in it? I probably don't not. know. I she don't... probably got the one that was, uh, it was published with Guardian Angel. And when their company okay. went broke, they took them off Amazon and off Barnes and Noble. Okay. So they, I mean, they were available everywhere. But uh, so the my only choice was to either sell it to somebody else and since I wasn't the illustrator, the idea oh. seemed to be better to buy the art and just self-publish it. Sure. Okay. Wow. 
Well, Water. it's a small world after <laughs> all. <laughs> it's a small world after all. I love it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I love moments like these. Um, That's so I, wonderful. <laughs> oh, my God. When you're writing about something like time travel, this was a question from before we, our little technical difficulty. Um, when you're writing about tri time travel, what are some things that you have to consider that maybe like, pe like you, you have to keep your stories? You can any rule you want on how it's done. But once you've made the rule, you can't break it. Uh -huh. And yeah, uh, once you've set up your parameters and this is how it happened. For instance, in my first book, it was a virtual reality experience that got too real and went wrong mm. and took them actually back in time. And then it was turned out that that's what the machine did. It translated virtual reality into real time. And it worked as a concept. And at the end, everybody said, oh, that really worked. And the second one had to do with the same virtual reality machine. And uh, then the Lord Byron's daughter, it, it's a formula in an ancient Cyrillic book that has to be read alive, time is a river. And if you read this in the right order with three people, you can go back in time. So you've uh, made it doesn't a matter what it is, as long as you stick to the rules, which if any of you are Marvel fans. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, that one episode where Captain America turned up. No, they broke their own rule. And uh, my my son, my older son, who is a bigger Marvel fan than I am, keeps explaining to me that, no, they did not break their own rule. Yes, they did. They... <laughs> They clearly stated that you uh, couldn't go back that or forward and, and whatever it was. They, they made a rule. And then at the end of that last movie in the series, um, okay. who's the villain, the guy with the, uh, the glove? Uh, Thanos. 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 Yeah. In that series with Thanos, they made a rule about time travel and then broke it with the hmm. last movie in the series where they had Captain America coming forward i'm or trying something. to remember i don't it's remember it now, but i remember being in this series uh theater absolutely furious that they had broken their own rule sure because it's the one deal make your rules and then stick to, stick to them right yeah no, people catch that no no exceptions uh, there is um i have a <laughs> I have a coworker that I think that you and she would just get along with fabulously. Um, we were talking about, um, what was it? Uh, Dr. Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Mm -hmm. I mean, there she had a 20-minute rant about her issues with that movie. And was she wrong? No! She was 100% right about the things in that but she was so passionate about like, and what about <laughs> yeah. this continuation and this from this movie and this and this isn't. And, and I, and after all of that rant, I just went, you're a Marvel fan. And <laughs> like, yes. And then proceeded to just talk about like these Marvel films and was able to connect the dots between these things and point out like very, very, very big plot holes. So your, your curiosity with, uh, with that, uh, is well justified. Oh, there. Josh said, there you go talking about your own movie again, Trey. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry. I've got to get my royalties where I can, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we we think he's Doctor Strange. Well. We know he's Doctor Strange. It's nice to meet you. I'm very fond of your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's just a lot like... Um, Benedict Cumberbatch, where he's tall, he's got the voice. Um, if you put a red cape on him, he can oh, yeah. do all the same things. Who also played um, the something game, the the uh, the the one I was talking about. He played Alan Turing. Oh, uh, the imitation, imitation game. game. Oh yeah, he's a wonderful actor. This just went full circle. Yeah, I love it. Can you time travel, Trey? 
Um, there are rules. Uh, <laughs> Did Susan make them up? <laughs> no, they're 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 they're. they're uh, I declined to call it. It is real science. Like uh, they have decided scientifically that you could probably travel forward. Oh, forward, not backward. But not backward. Because if you're traveling backwards, there are all the rules. If you uh, you can't go back and kill yourself, you can't meet people. Um, I mean, you can't change history. If you change history, you're splitting off and becoming an alternate universe. Sometimes you can get away in some books with changing your personal history in such a way that would not affect major history. I feel but like there are all kinds of rules about it and, you know, discussions about what makes good sure. travel. Um, Emily. Um, oh, I think it, Jacob, uh, someone Frank? we used to, yeah, we used to work with um, actually had a lot of theories on that. And we got into a very heated debate about this very topic in the store one day. Uh, amongst uh, selling suits of all things and having a, <laughs> this philosophical discussion of would this cause an internet or um, uh, oh, a glitch, a glitch in the con time continuum? Thank you. Uh, words are failing me today, but yes, uh, like would this cause a paradox? What would happen here? Uh, and we got very heated about this. I could see this conversation happening. Uh, definitely. Yeah, and the thing is, there are different writers who think different things about it. I love Robert Heinlein's ideas. I love a lot of people's ideas and time travel. Yeah. And it doesn't matter as long as they don't break their own rules. Right. If you make it logical, if you can make it so your readers can believe it, then you've done good time travel. Yeah. Like I remember Michael Crichton writing time travel and it was the book where they went back to like medieval times for the life of me. I can't remember the name of the book, which is terrible because I read it and saw they made a movie out of it and it was sad because the movie could have been better and yeah. forgive me for saying so. But because I thought the book was fabulous and I couldn't wait for it to be a movie. And he went into the whole quantum physics thing. And so, you know, Michael Crichton writes where like the first chapter is intro and the second chapter is like, we're going to explain the science behind why the rest of the book is feasible. And then the rest of the book. book. Yeah. And the, so then you're like set up for the rest of the book can feel like truth, whether it is or not. But I think he did a pretty good job of explaining it using quantum physics. But I imagine as a writer, then he had to go learn. You quantum have to physics. figure <laughs> out. Um, I, I've, I've done some quantum physics. I'm not an expert at all, but I've read some. Okay. Uh, and I, I find it fascinating. Yeah. It's, it was kind of mind-blowing at the time because I had not read anything really about quantum physics yet, let alone anything to do with time travel. But Jerry it was like... Jerry Zukoff, The Seat of the Soul, has okay. a lot of quantum physics. It's an old book. It's from the 90s. Hmm. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch... We don't know that time travel isn't true. True, yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't know that uh, we certainly don't know we're the only people in the universe. Right. I mean, that seems illogical. They don't have to look like us, but for one tiny, tiny planet in billions of galaxies to be the only ones with life is kind of ridiculous. Uh, I, I listened to another podcast recently. They were talking about if aliens could read. And it was like, can you imagine if aliens could make contact with us and they've built like spaceships and whatever to get to us in order to make contact, but somehow they haven't come up with a written language. <laughs> there is one. Oh, if you haven't read Connie Willis, the uh, it's hilarious. Okay. And it's about, it starts out just as your normal rom-com. She's going to Roswell, New Mexico, because her best friend is planning to marry another kook, and she wants to save her. 
And this mm -hmm. guy is into all of the stuff about e ETs. And she's there and they've given her a bridesmaid's dress that's that alien green. And she goes out to her friend's car to get some lights to make the museum less look look less like an alien wedding place. And she's kidnapped by an alien who looks like a tumbleweed and who does not have language, but he can whip things around with those tumbleweed arms. And it is such a funny book. And she ends up on the alien side. Mm. Uh, it's, it's really well. I had never heard of Connie Willis. She is apparently a grandmaster of science fiction. Now mm. I have to read more. But The Road to Roswell, guys, so good. Um, but in, in exploring the ET, she came up with all of this. She had one guy that was the alien uh, kidnapped in the car with her. And he knows all the theories and all the reasons that aliens do these things. And they're all bullshit. <laughs> I see my friend Pam Dumond, who is a wonderful writer, just got on here. Yeah. Hello. Hi, she Pam. Said, she said, love you, Sue Berger. Good job. Um, we are both uh, members of the, um, or were both members of the uh, Romance Writers of America uh a Los Angeles chapter and Pam has just moved out of state to North Carolina, but uh -huh. she's written some amazing books. And one of them, uh, the, the, the Pam, what was the uh, movie that you caused? That you <laughs> caused what a way to put it. <laughs> it it's a well-known movie, but uh, she did the research and it got the person. Okay. Trey is near North Carolina, so that's an interesting... She's got a bunch of good books out. She's got a series that has the Annie Grace series, uh, mm. and uh, then there's a series with uh, Kat that is a detective, and then there's a futuristic series and a time travel series. Uh, she hasn't answered yet, but Sandra said Carolina Romance Writer is a chapter in Charlotte, or at least it oh, was. Oh, yeah, she's part of that, and she's part of Sisters in Crime and things like that. Okay. That's awesome. Well, Pam, if you happen to be in the uh, Charlotte area, just let me know, because um, I actually live around that area. Um, but it would I would love to make a connection sometime. Uh, Susan, I um, we... I love one that we can talk about um, science fiction with you, uh, this in depth. And it's clear that it's like one of the things that inspires some of your books. What are some other inspirations that you have uh, when, when it comes to writing? Well, when it came to romance writing, uh, I never thought I'd do a thing like that. Yeah. Um, but there's a thing uh, which is happening now called NaNoWriMo. You probably know what that is. Mm -hmm. November is National Write a Novel Month. Okay. Yeah. And somebody told me about it. And up until that point, I had the longest thing I'd ever written was 16,000 words. It's a mid-grade novel that's never been published. And I had to try it just to see if I could do it. And uh, the romance, the whole thing came out of that. I started writing and it turned into a romance um, and it came from an idea once in my life, a long time ago, I kissed a stranger on a subway. And uh, we were just, and, and it's in the book, uh, I used the scene, but we were on a subway and it was hot, it was crowded, and we were packed in like hogs for slaughter. And they opened the door and another few people walked in. And this guy was looking at, we were both shaking our heads. And then we both started laughing. And it ended it being a kiss. Wow. And uh, we did not, uh, you know, he, he said, what's your name? And I said, and he said, where can I find you? And I said, no, let's leave the magic. And I didn't oh. follow up on it. So in the book, she followed up on it. Oh, wow. Oh, oh that's so cool. What a cool, wow, that's so awesome. And then every, the other books came from that. And, uh, but characters just come into your head. 
And the, it's so funny because my next book, maybe this time, uh, I went to a California dreaming workshop with a person who had a, a, a workshop on writing a book on a week. I thought, this is awesome. If I could write a book in a week, that would be so amazing. Yeah. And my friend lent me his house in Ventura because he was going away. I was all by myself, just me and the laptop. And I didn't have to answer to anybody or do anything. And I got up in the morning and I started and I stopped for a walk on the beach, did a little yoga. I started at nine in the morning and stopped at one in the evening. And I had 6,000 words. Now, if you magnify that by seven, that is not a book. No. No, that's not going to be a book. And that was my best day. But I did get a book in three weeks. And uh, I started out with the hero. hero um, my heroine is the sister of the hero in the first book. And it was mentioned in the first book uh, that she'd been married three times and that the third time was lucky. So I started with that. What I didn't realize is that the third time was to her first husband that she remarried. And oh. it just got, and I could not figure out until I walked on the beach what was going to happen next. My mind would not tell me. Sure. I find that very annoying. Do it, you guys write? Does that happen to you? Or You got to step away. And yeah, like, your mind just won't tell you. Yeah. You can sit there as long as you want, but it's not going to tell you one thing. Yeah, I have that going on. Well, right now for an idea I have that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Nano helps you with that because okay, you need a word count. You need about 2,500 words a day if you're going to take off weekends and Thanksgiving in November. And uh, therefore, you write something and you think, oh, my God, that is terrible. I can never use this. This is ridiculous. But it's word count. Keep writing. Right. And you write through the crap. And eventually you end up with stuff you can use. It's a first draft you're going to get. Yeah. Well, it's nothing but a first draft. It's not really showable to anybody. Right. But at least it's out there. Um, yeah. And so George R.R. Martin, if you're listening, <laughs> I want you to go <laughs> to <laughs> nanorimo.org. I'm glad well, you got that. Look, huh? I mean, something, something. Well, you look it. at uh, Jen Cruzy, Jennifer Cruzy. She yeah. had a writer's block for 12 years. Yes. And that story is amazing. And, and, that, and believe me, I was there waiting. Yeah, I'm sure. For, with everybody else who follows ARG Inc. waiting for that book. Mm -hmm. And also for another one she hasn't got out yet, The Devil and Nita Dodd. But I know it's going to come out. Well, and there was... If you saw the show that she was on, she talks about how many books she has that aren't published that she's started or mm -hmm. is somehow in. And she sent several to Bob. And it sounds like Bob, he, he announced it on our show that he was, he had finished or pretty much finished this one and he hadn't, told her, hadn't told her yet. And it was really cool news. Yeah. And she, so, uh, I think has been through that now, but he's on the second book and is, uh, it's funny reading their blog, reading her blog, because sometimes she'll put uh, the exchanges, the text exchanges between them up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's fabulous. Very crazy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're what a, what a mind blowing relationship they have with each other. No, um, They hadn't seen each other for years until the show. And we didn't know that. <laughs> Didn't we, didn't, tell us. we didn't know what we were getting into, but it turned out to be so great. It was, yeah, quite the dynamic duo, Josh said. That is mm -hmm. accurate. Yeah. In fact, I think we were recommended to have you on the show by Jenny Kersey. She did. And I couldn't yeah. believe that. And I said, but, you know, both uh, at right about that time, I got something from AARP magazine asking if they could put time and forever on their list of books, sexy reads for the winter. Awesome. And I said, and I, she said, yeah, I got one of those. And I said, yeah, but you're famous. And she looked at, you know, she wrote back, you're famous. I thought, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's one of those uh, things of like the people that we look up to and we're like, 
okay, one, you know who I am. And then two, you're like, oh, you're recommending me for things. I know. Um, that's just amazing. It's, um, yeah. Thinking, thinking through some of the guests that we have, uh, that we've had on the show even recently, like, I have to say that 2023 has been like a year for us on the podcast to have some incredible individuals. You are definitely one of them that, um, especially wow. with some of the just coincidences that we found just on this episode. Oh um, but it's crazy to look back and just go, wow, it really is such a small world. And then you go, we really are just like human people. Um, huh. And yeah. getting to talk to getting to talk to them that they are incredible individuals who are artistic and absolutely deserve uh, deserve the praise that they have. But it's also so nice to see them just be human, yeah, um, and just be themselves. Yeah, because we're all artists somehow. I, I, absolutely. And the funny thing, I have seen a lot of people get famous, you know. Sure. Um, Barry was in Northern Exposure, and that was a huge, huge hit TV series. And the only person who went before that, uh, the only recognizable face was Barry. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my husband's name is Barry Corbin. And okay. they list his birthday and stuff in October. He's on everything. But I saw so many people not be able to deal or have difficulty when they're told, oh, now I'm a big thing. And it can, uh, it's his uh, friend, G.W. Bailey, who's one of the leads yeah. in The Closer. G.W. said, you know, they can get a touch of the big head. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people get a touch of the big head. But uh, most of them don't. They're just amazing, fun people. And yeah. it's, it's easy, though, I have to say, when people start telling you how great you are, it can be easy to forget that everybody else is just as great. Yeah. You just got noticed. And that's nice. Uh, but it doesn't mean everybody has an amazing story. It does. Yeah. And everybody's worth looking and watching. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, we believe that here, too. Very oh, much yeah. so. Yeah. You know, if you haven't been discovered yet, so what? That doesn't make you any less valuable. Do you know that no. Jack London had a 601 101 rejections, I think, before he sold? Wow. Now that's somebody with persistence. Yeah, you'd think someone would might consider giving up. But he must have really he I don't really, know. Dr. Seuss. Uh mm -hmm. 31 rejections before the 32nd person wanted to publish it. And now, of course, they're trying to take it off the market to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, which oh. I happen to love. But uh, there's so many people with those stories, so many rejections. And it doesn't mean you didn't do something good, and whether it's your job or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's a, um, I belong to a group on Facebook. Um, I won't name the name of it, but it's a group of like classical singers who, um, we go through this big audition season from probably about, I would say about October through about March ish. That's when the normal like contracts are being handed out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they refer to the rejection letters as PFOs. Please use your imagination. I will not announce what that stands for on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> I know uh, what that stands for. <laughs> um, but, I can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the one thing that I can look at this group and say that it's with such certainty that it's a positive force is to look at people and saying, okay, well, it's PFO season. Everybody announce what you've received PFOs from and turn it from being a like a negative thing into almost a humorous sort of thing um, mm -hmm. and look at it as a learning experience to say, oh, you know what? Okay, cool. The, it's a limited, it's a very like specific field. 
Um, like, why not have a little bit of fun with it? Absolutely. They do the same thing for the Minnesota State Fair for the photography. Cause I'm in a oh, photography yeah. group for that. And it's, Oh, this, and they'll post their picture that is phenomenal. They'll post pictures that are just drop dead gorgeous and be like, yep, this one was rejected. <laughs> and they all oh, just nice. laugh about it. Cause it's oh, like, well, what can you do? Who is it? Um, ear Van Gogh. Yeah. He pulled only one painting in his lifetime. Yeah. Did that mean he wasn't good? I don't think so. Right. Okay. So uh, the big trick is trying to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. and say, I have a gift. Uh, who is it? Agnes DeMille or somebody said, uh, you were given a gift and it isn't your business to decide whether it's good or bad or right or wrong. Your business is to give it. And that's it. That's, yeah. And I didn't say it right, but that's the general idea. It's good. Yeah, that's that's enough. Mm -hmm. You said it in Susan style, and that's what matters. Yes. <laughs> um, so for you, like, um, when you step away, when you go to, um, like, you... How am I trying to phrase this? You push everything out. You go into your corner or wherever you go to read. You sit down, you open it, you pull a book off the shelf, and you open it's your favorite book. What is that book? Not possible. I'm a bookaholic. <laughs> mm, good answer. I'm sorry. Over here are my Wizard of Oz. All over here, my Susan Elizabeth Phillips, my Jude Devereaux. My Jane Ann Krantz has too many Never. shelves to be. Uh, the Time Travel in Curland. I have so many favorite books. Uh, like Susan Elizabeth Phillips has one named Natural Born Charmer that I have given away so many times. It's a joke. And then I just <laughs> read The Ill-Mannered ben uh, Benevolent Society. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Great. I've completely lost the name of it. Um let me see if I can pull it up on the other computer. It's Bill <laughs> Mannered uh, Ladies Benevolent Society or something. And it is a um, Regency book. And it's obviously book one. And it's getting lots. Oh, forget that. Chemistry of Law. Uh, uh, no. Lessons in Chemistry. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. That has just become a series on Apple. And I started watching it. And I was blown away. I'd already read the book. And the book was wonderful. The series is amazing. And then I looked at who wrote it and produced it. And it, it's a guy named Lee Eisenberg. And as a matter of fact, he produced Jury Duty. Oh. Oh, wow. And so I immediately wrote him a fan letter. because, And he says it's really thrilling to hear that people like it. But it's brilliant. Do you find that you read a book and you just don't want to stop? Yeah, of course. Yes. So I, hate, I hate the back cover. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I will reread. Uh, Georgette Heyer um, is a Regency novel writer who inspired so many people. And uh, he is, uh, she, she's amazing. Um, and I reread a couple of hers all the time. I've started putting books I've read on my Kindle, like Robert Heinlein. Just in case I don't want to go to my bookshelf, I can just pull it on out of my phone, which right. is nice. That's awesome. Uh, and of course, Jennifer Cruzy and Bob Mayer, that, that series. I can't wait for the next series. Right. And she has one that I just adore called Faking It. And it's about a family who forges paintings. Oh, oh. neat. And it is just so funny, but they may, this is a generational family forging paintings. Wow. Uh, that was so much fun. And again, I've given it away so many times. I'm not sure I have it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, have you read Lord of the Rings? Of course. My, uh, it's funny. My brother, uh, I have a younger brother, had a younger brother and we're two and a half years apart. And our deal was that we had to read each other's books. So he read all the Nancy Drews and I read all the Tom Swifts and the Hardy Boys. Awesome. And uh, he had a really good reading list, including the Once and Future King. 
in his mm. freshman year at boarding school. But he, when he married, would not marry his wife till she finished the Tolkien trilogy. Good, mm. good man. <laughs> yeah. I read Hobbit first and hated it, but he made me read the rest of it. And I loved it. I mean, the Lord of the Rings is... He also wrote a short yeah. story called Leaf by Niggles that was pretty amazing. Hmm. It's L-E-A-F by Niggles, N-I-G-G-L-E-S. Are you and looking it I up, think it's about a perfect mm -hmm. leaf, but it's a short story. We'll have to, I um, haven't read that one. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's a fun one. And I'm similar to you. I didn't, I struggled with The Hobbit and didn't love it as much as the rest of the the trilogy. No, the I was Rings 12 trilogy. when I had to read that. I was in boarding school in South Africa and mm. it was required. And I, it wasn't, I, at that point I was fairy tales and biographies and mm. it didn't do a thing for me. I can't imagine having that as required because I didn't have it required, but oh, I don't know. I feel like for that required in the olden days, Right. Uh, there was one called Mill on the Floss. Hmm. It's not required anymore, but in the 50s, it mm -hmm. was a required English book, and it's horrible. Uh, <laughs> she does not recommend it. <laughs> no, I used to use, um, oh, if I could get it, the classic comic book instead of the actual book. Red Badge of Courage, I read the comic oh, yeah. book. Yes. The comic oh. book. Yeah, I remember reading the Red Badge of Courage, and I liked parts of it, like the first couple of chapters. I remember enjoying, but then I slugged through the remainder of it. It was that was a chore. Yeah, that, that and Grapes of Wrath were just oh. chores. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm I'm really sorry, Steinbeck. Uh, it it is a classic. I know, but mm -mm, not for me. <laughs> no, I did not like it. And uh, I, on the other hand, I like happy endings. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Some people are that. I know people who love true crime and mm -hmm. need that. I need happy endings. And I had a couple of kids' books that I, and they, there was a series and I loved it. And then at one point she killed off one of the major characters in a kid's book. Who oh, does no. that kind of thing? That's <laughs> cruel. That's really cruel. And then I, you know, I get very involved with the characters. So mm -hmm. if something happens to them, there was another book called Advice and Consent by Alan Drury, which was about a senator. And it was a very good political thriller, but then he commits suicide. And it took me months to get over that because the person was real to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I felt. Um, I got the audiobook for The Song of Achilles. Um, and it is, I mean, it is a very, f well, uh, let's just say it like this. It is a mostly faithful telling of like the love story between Achilles and, um, oh, I'm going to mess this name up, uh, Patroclus. I think I butchered Patrick that. Patroclus, uh, I think. Yes. P A T R. O C L U S. Yes. Maybe I'm better at spelling than I am at pronunciation. Um, we'll go with that pronunciation, but it's it is like wow. That book is one of those that I can only read about a chapter at a time because of how in depth it goes into like their their psyche, their emotions, etc. Mm -hmm. And you walk away with like feeling like you are s just plastered in molasses. Um, yeah, I can't do that. Mm -mm. And, and I, I won't go to the, I did not see um, the book that's, uh, the one that's out, the movie that's out right now about the atom bomb. Oh, uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, yeah. because I already knew about it. My um, cousin's, first, my mother's cousin's first husband was on the Manhattan Project. Wow. And for the H bomb part, and killed himself. And I knew about Oppenheimer, and I knew about the project. And there's a wonderful children's book called The Bomb, uh, 
was Stephen somebody, and he, he won all kinds of prizes. Uh, the the these making stealing and stuff of the uh, world's uh, greatest weapon, and it mm -hmm. won all kinds of awards. I mean, so I I bought it because I thought I wanted to, and it was really it, it reads like a thriller. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, the, the name of it is Bomb, and uh, it's it's brilliantly written, and but it goes into all the people that were trying to steal the secrets and and into the Manhattan Project and everything, and I, I don't want to see a movie about it. Mm. Been there, done that. Don't want to do that. Yeah. Don't show me those movies, and 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 I'm grateful for anybody who wants to watch them, but it's just not my thing. Sure. It's like my kids don't have to read my romances. <laughs> <laughs> no, but everybody else does. Yes. <laughs> if they're not my kid, it's all right. Right. If they're not your kid. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, um, I, I have really, I have two last questions that I want to ask. Um, okay. So first, uh, you talked a little bit about um, like your acting work and what you're currently, uh, what you've worked on most recently, but I want to make sure our listening audience knows of your current projects and upcoming projects. Uh, Can you tell us a little oh, bit? Oh, I could if there were any. Uh, you have to understand, Jury Duty came out when they already knew that there was going to be a strike for oh. the writers. And then the actors struck. So uh, there hasn't been any work for, I did a commercial for Nerd Wallet, which will be soon somewhere oh, yeah. and I'm singing in it. Okay. Uh, that I did in Vancouver last week, but uh, I, oh, I have a movie that hasn't come out called The Legend of Cloudy Falls, which was okay. a lot of fun. It was filmed in uh, Canada and I narrate it and I'm also in it. Nice and lots of it's funny because I'm on a lot, and they have pictures that you know you see me doing things a lot, but uh, it's all voiceover except one scene, and it was so much fun to do. Uh, that's still going to come out. I also have a short film, which I've forgotten the name of. Oh shoot! Okay, uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> And I, I did that. There were things that were happening during the strike that you could do if sure. you, there were certain uh, projects. Commercials were accepted. This was not a commercial strike. It was a TV theatrical strike. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that this is going to mean that we'll be getting work and that yeah. those of us on jury duty who got noticed for jury duty will suddenly be getting jobs because that would be terrific. Yeah, it would. Yes, for sure. I pretty much think everybody on that show is amazing. Also, the crew, the cinema, the the top photographer, the cinematographers, the writers, the producers, everybody. I know Jake's been working, our director, but he d works on a lot of commercials. Mm. Hmm. But I don't know who else has been working. I mean, it was such a gem, and very clear that there were many hands. Very, very many very capable and amazingly talented hands involved with that show. So I, it seems feasible that everybody stands a really solid chance of a future. People were real nice on the strike line. Said <laughs> they liked it and some of them were producers. So uh, good. Awesome. Good. And then as far as your writing. Well, I have the uh, maybe this time was just republished. Yes. And is now available on Amazon and it will be available as a print book. And all three of the books in the series are available at the library for free. Um, <laughs> and I had a great narrator. I loved her. I have awesome. We'll see. I'd like to put out Lord Byron's daughter next. It's been through its edit. Yeah. That's awesome. You can do that. Yeah, but first I want to find out what happens with maybe this time because that's my first self-publish. Right. Well, we're going to watch. We're going to watch to see what you do. And um, I can't, I can't wait, I can't wait to see. 
Yeah. It'd be really fun if they could figure out a way to make a second season, but I was wondering. I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. They'd have to put it somewhere else, and I they couldn't use any of us. Right. Or, or else be... they'd have to find somebody who never saw the show and and that that they could probably do because lots of people haven't seen jury duty my uh cousins um a lot of my friends you know i know lots of people haven't seen jury duty i was in the hospital to get a knee replacement oh. and nobody there had seen it so. wow <laughs> <laughs> so you're recommending it to everybody i hope <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then to make sure that for like content or to stay in touch with you and notices of when your books get published or when you are on the second season of jury duty um, or whatever future projects <laughs> you have, um, where can our listening audience stay in touch with you? Uh, let's see. I'm on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And both as an author page, Susan B. James, and as Susan James Berger or Susan J. Berger. Who am yes. I? Yes. It's on um, Facebook, you're Sue Berger 3, and as an author, you're Susan B. James. Uh -huh. No, I have this wrong. It's, it's Berger Susan James on Instagram. On Facebook, it's Sue Berger 3. Um, and then I it's susanbjames.com is website and uh -huh. susanbergeractor.com. That's my acting site. Yeah. Since I do voiceover, I'm required to have an acting site. That's the only way you get voiceover. Sure. And then Susan James Berger on TikTok. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I wrote that down somewhere. Oh, look, <laughs> you put it up there. Yeah, I did. I see it. Yeah. Oh, right. And when this episode's published, we we link all that as well, so people will be able to find you. All right. Thank you. Of Ooh. course. This has been a pleasure. You it guys, thank you. Really fun to talk to. Thank you. You what? have been great. I can't believe your beekeeping. That's amazing. Singing, I understand. Beekeeping. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an adventure. I'll bet. Yeah, because I'm new to it still, so I haven't gotten through a whole year yet, but um, it's an adventure. I started putting the videos on TikTok, and those have been a little popular. It's really fun. They seem to like me so far. Oh, that's <laughs> the bees. great. Yeah, they get to know you. Text and you get me to... a link. What's that? Text me a link to a bee. I will do that. Okay. Yeah, they get to... you get used to hearing what their different buzzes mean. So you can tell, like, everybody kind of knows what an angry bee sounds like. But, like, there are different buzzes when they're, like, cooling down the hive or when they're stuck <laughs> in a spot. You, It sounds different. Wow. You get used to that. And they say that the queen makes sounds that are different, too, but I haven't detected that yet. So we'll see. I'd love to hear that. We we talked about a little bit of that whenever I did like a touring kids performance of a of a B opera, mm. um, and there were like different dances that they'll do and like uh, different sounds that they can make based on the sound of their wings, um, and that was part of like the education for the kids before they came to the opera and watched us do the things and we would hear them say like, oh, they're doing that, they're doing that, oh, they're going to go get pollen. Uh, so oh, that's awesome. So that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, I am really looking forward to the time that I can come out and visit and you will just take me out to the bee with like no protection uh, from the bees and just go pull up one of the like the slats and just go, mm -hmm, here are all the bees. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do do that. Um, yeah, you can. Yes. I mean, when I'm getting deep into the hive, like where the brood box is, they're very protective over their babies. So I will wear my bee suit to get into the brood box because I don't want to make them so angry that they want to sting me. Cause right. one wrong move. It happened one time and it hurt. <laughs> oh, no. It did. It hurt, but it was kind of my fault. I messed up. I slipped with a high, with the frame Ooh. and they didn't like that much. So, 
I, yeah. I'm learning, like I said, and you know, I don't want to hurt any of them. You know what? You know what's funny? The mo you know what the most common question I get about the bees is? What? How many do you have? <laughs> really? And I don't know how to answer. Why would my anybody know the answer to that? My, my own father asked me that. I was like, um, I don't know how to tell you this, Dad. It's like a couple thousand. <laughs> Dear God, that's it. <laughs> I, I don't count them. There's too many. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like God. ten. I don't. Know. How did you get into that? Um, I've always wanted to, and. Um, Josh, who you met before the yeah. show, our moderator, he's my boyfriend and he gifted me with a beehive for Christmas last year and we got bees in June. We got a colony that's local because I'm in Minnesota. So we got a colony locally because bees need to be able to get through the winter here. Right. And yeah, you're in so Minnesota. We, yeah. Minnesota. So these are hardy bees and um, they're honeybees, but they're just they know how to get through a winter here. And I just always wanted to. So he also got me a couple of books on beekeeping, which helped a lot. Cause I've learned that if you join Facebook groups on beekeeping, you're going to get every answer under the sun <laughs> on, on your uh, problems. But I mean, I'm getting there. You kind of have to, it's one of those things you have to feel out for yourself, like what's working and what isn't. Yeah. And that's something they don't always tell you. No, I imagine not. Because every bee. It's easier to write books. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it is. Yeah. I mean, you're at least not completely. You don't have to feel responsible for thousands of lives. Yes. I, I like things where I don't have to feel responsible for thousands. <laughs> I, I really, I don't have a dog or a cat. Yeah. I mean, I have grandkids, but. Right. That's different. <laughs> but I can go away if I want. Right. <laughs> or you can uh away. you can uh you can tell them how to bake you something too um, yes right. bake a cake <laughs> that's wonderful oh gosh well susan you are such a multifaceted person and it has honestly been such a joy to have you yes. um and it is so nice to meet the woman who uh made me slightly terrified um <laughs> but also so uh which was amazing to find out that you had written a book that's in my mom's house. That's um, so cool. And uh hey, and I, your mom for me. I will. Um I got to talk to an author of one of our books. Um <laughs> and um and I mean just to be just such a, a, a fun person in general to talk to. Um it is really nice to have this time with you here. Well thank you. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being real with us. And I hope you come back and hang out with us again sometime. Oh, I'd love it. I'll do something and then you'll want me back. Yeah. Different. Yes. Okay. That would be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll have all kinds of fun. Well, uh -oh. um, you're the kids. <laughs> uh, well, as we close out this episode here, uh, this episode, along with probably every episode, will always be in memory of Joe Capone, our moderator, fellow comedian, passionate encourager, and greatly missed friend. You can find us pretty much wherever you tune into podcasts. For updates, announcements, and more, please follow us on social media under Modern Romantic. Thank you, everybody, and have a buzzworthy day. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.